get Paris. He whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the night resemble when he lay couched in the ominous horse, hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal. Head to foot now as he total jewels, horridly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted in the marching street. Lend a tyrannous and damned light to their lord's with wrath and fire. And thus oversized with coagulant gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus, old grandsire of Brian C. And on he finds him striking too short the Greeks. His antic sword, rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command, unequal match to Pyrrhus at Priam drives, in rage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, Seeming to feel this blow with flaming top, stoops to his base and with a hideous crash takes prisoner Pyrrhus' ear. For lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of Reverend Prime, seems in the air to stick. So was the painted tyrant Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter did nothing. As we often see against some storm, silence in the heavens, the rack stands still, the bold wind speechless, and the orb below as harsh as death, and on the thunder doth rend the region. So after Pyrrhus pause, arouse it vengeance, set in new work. Never did the Cyclops' hammers fall on Mars's armor forged for proof return with less remorse than Pyrrhus' bleeding sword now falls on Priam. Out, out, our strumpet fortune. Oh, ye gods and generals, sooner take away her power. Break all the spokes and fellies from her wheel and bowl the round and nave down the hill of heaven as low as to the fiend. But who, oh, who had seen the mobile queen run barefoot up and down, threatening the flames with bis and rune? A clout upon that head where late the diadem stood. for a robe about her lank and all our timid loins a blanket and the alarm of fear caught up who this had seen with tongue and venom steeped against fortune's state with treason and pronounced and if the gods themselves did see her then when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport in mincing with his sword, her husband's limbs, the instant burst of clamor that she made. Unless things mortal move them not at all. Would have made milk the burning eyes of heaven into passion in the gods. This is Hamlet. Prince of Denmark, by William Shakespeare, first performed in 1601. A 
I'm Nicaratus, I'm an actor, and I have a story. Forty, forty years ago, on a typical sunny but cold day in spring at the theater festival of Dionysus in Athens, my father, Artemisius, also an actor, you might remember him, comes on stage. This King Pantheos in the back eye of Euripides, dressed in a heavy-sleeved gown, padded in the chest and shoulders as he is like me, a slight man, and I don't know what possesses him. He is famous for his quick changes, wearing his queen agave underneath. He sweats through, he leaves the stage, he changes masks and comes back on again as the distracted queen in the damp gown. The sun goes in and he chills to his bone. You would never have known it. I've not heard him better. He's famous for his women, especially the crazy ones. Cassandra, Agave, the tear, tear ringers like Naomi, but he has no luck this day. This day, the leading man who plays the god gets the prize. He holds a party. Father doesn't like to leave early in case it shall be misunderstood, so he stays drinking till past midnight. Cold goes to his chest with a high fever, and on the third night he dies. Though I am 19, at the time, it's the first death in our house since I have been born and I, I'm dazed by it. I'm just dazed by it. The house turned upside down. Father lying on his bier with his feet towards the door. And mother and grandmother and sister wailing and flinging their arms across him. Small room full of neighbors and actors edging and shouldering in and out to pay respects. The neighbors leave quite soon. Outsiders never know what to say about an actor, but his, his fellow artists, they hang about. They keep saying how good he was to work with, Nico, always ready to help a friend. My, my, my mother can attest to this. He never dried, they said, could keep going through anything. And, and then they told some tales that make me stare, not having yet learned anything can happen on tour. What talent he had, they say. Poor Artemidras, Nico. Disgrace, he was passed over at the Lanaya. Nobody remembers seeing a polyxena done with more feeling, but the lot fell on some poor judges this year. Well, I don't know. By this time, how long I have known that I had more talent than he two years, three, three years, I'm 16 when I see him play Achilles in the sacrifice at Arles and I doubt it is new to me even then. He moves well. He can say anything with his hands. His voice charming, he makes Achilles a delightful youth. Spirited, sincere. Arrogant, but too boyish to offend. Oh, yeah, they can eat him up. Hardly noting his Agamemnon. Cannot wait till he comes back as Achilles. With the shadow of all that darkness. The black grief beside the shore. 
the dreadful war yell whose pain and anger scares even the horses it is close ahead one ought to feel it breathe it creeps in my hair where he speaks of his slight and honor but already i hear another player hardly yet knowing whom He has everything the artist needs except the spark of the light. I've been going on with him ever since I can stand. I remember quite clearly playing a Steenax to his Andromache in The Women of Troy, also by Euripides, when I'm six. Astinax needs to act, so father tells me the plot and promises I won't really be thrown from the walls in spite of all the talk about it. First rehearsal, he sends me out in front to see the masks as the audience sees them. Climbing up high above the seats of honor, I'm surprised how human they look, how sad. And then, while I'm up there, he does his Cassandra for me. God mad with two torches. He's really marvelous. It's his greatest role, everyone agrees. I fight for years to go on thinking him great. And then they change masks, ready for Andrew Markey. The play where they bring her in from the sack to Troy in a cart piled with loot, and the child in her arms, just two more pieces of plunder. A wonderful bit of theater. Don't look at the audience. Don't look at the Herald, he says to me. At rehearsal. You're not supposed to know what he means, though any child would that is right in the head. Hmm. I remember the first performance. I'm aggrieved there is no mask for me, though I have been told children do not use them. Never mind, he says. The time will come, and then he, he pulls his own mask down, the smiling face going into a solemn one. He's in the prologue as Athene. Outside the orchestra, the cart is waiting, drawn by four oxen, with the gilded spoils of Troy. At last comes the call boy and my father in the pale mask of the shorn-haired widow. He clambers up. Somebody hoists me after. He sets me on his knee and the oxen start. Now, don't look at the audience, he says to me. You are scared of strangers. Think how they just chopped up your poor old granddad, Brian. Not how I direct the steel axe. He's Hector's son. I like him alert and bold, thinking no evil till the time. But my father knows his business. Even the men are sighing as we come slowly into the orchestra. And I hear the little coos and the cries of the women floating on this deep base. And then quite suddenly it takes a hold of me. My father and I, by ourselves, are doing this for 15,000 people. We will carry them all with us to Troy and make them see us just as we choose to be. I 
can taste it still, that first sip of power. And of course, when the Herald comes with the news that I must die, I remember I'm not supposed to heed him, but I think I ought to look sorry for my mother's grief. So I reach out and I touch the mask's dead hair, and at this I hear a sighing and a sobbing rise like a wave from the block where the, the, the hetera, the prostitute, the courtesans sit who love a good cry more than faith and really know the tragedies. And when the herald bears me off to die, I think everyone backstage will be there to pay me compliments. <laughs> but only the wardrobe master's assistant comes in a hurry to strip me naked and paint on my bloody wounds. My father exits soon after, runs over to pat my bare belly as I lay and say, good boy, and then he's off. Quick change, and then I'll make it to Helen, Helen of Troy always the most splendid costume. And then he's on again. And I hear the new voice, bland and beguiling, answering angry men aloud. So now the cue comes for me to be brought on dead. They stretch me on a shield and two extras pick it up. I give my mind to lying limp as I have been told. The chorus calls out the dreadful news to my granny, Hecuba. Lying with my eyes shut while the herald makes a long speech about my death, I pray Dionysus will not let me sneeze. There's a pause. And then a terrible low voice says, right beside me, lay down the circled shield of Hector on the ground. A hateful thing to look at, it means no love to me. I have been very well rehearsed in this scene but not with Hecuba, I've seen the mask only. This is Croesus, the leading man. And at the peak of his powers, he does not expect to tutor children. The voice seems to go all through me, making my backbone creep with cold. I forget it as I was being mourned for. There's no sweetness here in Hecuba. Old pride brought naked to despair, still new to it. At the bottom of the pit, a new pit opens, and still the mind can feel. Cold hands touch my head. So silent is the theater above us that I can hear quite clearly. In the pines outside, the murmur of a dove. Not yet seven, I think I remember, though no doubt I have mixed in scraps from all sorts of later renderings, from Theodorus, Philemon, Thetalos, even from my own. But the one thing I remember for certain is a tightening in my throat and the horror that comes over me. <laughs> I'm going to cry. I'm going to wreck the play. Sponsor will lose his prize, Croesus his crown. Father will never get a part again. We shall be in the streets begging for our bread. And worst of all, I shall have to face the terrible Hecuba after the play without the mask. Tears spring from my eyes. My nose is running. 
I pray that I might die or that the earth will open and I'm gathered into the arms of Hecuba, the wrinkled mask bent close above the f flute that has been moaning softly during the herald's speech, getting a cue now wails loudly and underneath the noise, Queen Hecuba whispers in my ear, be quiet, you little bastard, you're dead. Right away, I feel better. slide back, limp, and as he washes and shrouds me, he deftly wipes my nose. The scene goes on to the end, and yet had not the very hand of God gripped and crushed this city deep in the ground. We should have disappeared into darkness and not given theme for music or the songs of men to come. As the extras carried me off, I thought, we are the men to come. Now, my father has seen all this from the wings. And he rushes up, asking what has come over me. Father, I did not make a noise, I say at once. And then Croesus comes off. He stops, he stares, releasing the trance. Pushes up his mask. He's a, a thin man, all profile, like a god on a coin, but bald. And then he comes towards us. And fishes me out, squirming from behind him, my father's back, all smeared with blood, paint, and snot. And then he grins. He's not angry. By the dog, I thought we were finished then. Grimacing like a comedian slave mask. Artemidorus. This boy has feeling, but he also knows what he is about. What is your name, boy? Nico, I say. Nicaratus, says my father. Victory, says Croesus. A good omen. Well, we shall see. Many scenes like this from my childhood come back to me as I stand at the door, now man of the house, receiving people come to honor my father. I, I, I weep, I do weep. You see, by this time, my heart has forsaken my father for the God that we both serve. There's nothing really of choice in this. It's tragic, tragedy. You misuse that word today. And I fight the God for him. <laughs> what a house today, I will say. They must have heard the applause all the way at the Karamaikos. The business with the urn, oh, it would have melted stone. I saw General Ephicrates crying. There's always something you can say, something true. But the great things that every artist hopes for the harsh God he closes my mouth upon. And he misses them. I know he misses them. I can see it in his eyes. Why not just say that? God. They have everything and they live forever. 
Lampreas. Do you, do you remember Lampreas? Nobody in Athens remembers Lampreas. So down around the Argolid, they still talk of his Agamemnon, his mad Heracles, at all events. Lampreas is in town when father dies, and he owes him more money than most. Uh, is as usual, nearly broke, but trying to fit up a tour for peanuts. So he offers to take me on as extra. He looks at me embarrassed as my mother accepts for me, knowing what I know already, I am better than this. And then he glances away at my father. <laughs> I too have looked to see him sit up on his beer and say, you mad boy. Wow. Well, 19, one is good for nothing in the theater. Even as third actor, one must have the range to let one play, not only boys and women, but also uh, warriors and old men and tyrants. And no lad of that age can do it, whereas... Uh, a good man who has kept his voice in training and his body supple can keep wearing the juvenile mask till he's past 50. I reckon I need three years to learn before I am offered good roles in good productions. And even for three weeks, my mother cannot keep me idling. We have been left so poor by father's generosity, always ready to help a friend indeed. Let me tell you something. If you ever go drinking with actors, do not be the last to leave the table. <sighs> well, Lamprias is relieved. I accept so quickly. Don't embarrass him. Good boy, good boy, he says. Your father's son, a real professional. The range will come. We all know that. In the meantime, a tour like this will be the making of you. No real artist knows himself till he's done a tour. In the evening, we bury my father. It's a very good turnout. He'd be pleased. And afterwards, we um, go home and light the lamps, and straighten the room and look about us as people do, not wanting to think what next. On my behalf, Greece sows undue alarm. I thought that weightier matters were at stake, my lord, and her ambassador's prestige made me expect more grandiose designs. Who would believe in fact that this Demarche was worthy of great Agamemnon's son, that a whole people crowned with victory? would stoop to plot only an infant's death. And who demands the sacrifice of me? Does Greece still hold some title to his life? And may not I alone in Greece dispose of this, my captive, that was mine by lot? Yes, Prince, when near the reeking walls of Troy, the blood-stained conquerors shared the spoils of war by lot, as was agreed, I was assigned Andromache and her son, Ulysses, drew well laden Hecuba, Cassandra took the road to Argos with your father, did I interfere with them, or tamper with the fruits of their exploits. With a new Hector, Troy will rise again, you say. His son, if spared, will be my doom, my lord. Such prudence shows too much concern. I cannot see troubles so far ahead. I call to mind that town in former days. Soaring ramparts, heroes, myriad, mistress of Asia. And they contemplate the fate of Troy, her future destiny. I see but towers covered with ashes. And the river stained with blood. Deserted fields. 
the boy in chains, and I cannot conceive that Troy laid low can ever seek revenge. Oh, if the death of Hector's son was sworn, why did you wait until a year was by? And Priam's breast he should have been dispatched, buried beneath the dying under Troy. Then, then all things were just. Old men and boys in vain upon their feebleness relied. Victory and night, more cruel far than we, incited us to want, wanton, murderous blows. But that my cruelty should outlive my wrath? That I, despite the pity that I feel, should wallow calmly in infant's blood? No, sir, let the Greeks find some other prey. Let them seek elsewhere Troy's poor remains. My fierce hostility has run its course. The pious guards all that was saved of Troy. Pyrrhus from Alumaki by Jean Racine after Euripides. First performance, 1661.